Let's move on to um, special N, as in Nancy, Mr. Lee, you called that special as well as Mr. Blumenfield. Go ahead, Mr. Lee. This, we're on N as a Nancy? Okay. N as a Nancy, <clears throat> yes. So in the first I further move, while I think it's important that we are uh, suspending the you know, evictions due to the hardships of COVID-19, this, this paragraph talks about 24 months to fulfill the payment obligations back. I think we often remember that these, some of these are mom and pop businesses that have business, you know, have bills to pay, have mortgages to do. I don't even know if it's legal for us to interfere with a contract that they have with their, with their tenant, but two years seems awfully long. I propose that we just bring that back to a more reasonable amount of six months to fulfill the payment obligations? Okay, is, there a, is, that, is that your motion, sir? Is there a second? Second. Mr. Krikorian's gonna go ahead and second that. <clears throat> okay, that's one. Mr. Blumenfield, did you have anything to add to it? Another amendment uh, to that, this motion? That was the, the same. I'm just looking at that number, trying to figure out what's best, and I, it's hard to know without expert advice so I think we could you know set a time limit like you've said with the option to renew uh, after we get more information and figure it out I mean I think it, we need to do this but we need to as we learn how bad the pandemic is down the road make that number appropriate with the appropriate expertise I'm just not prepared to throw a number out of months I, I it's agree. completely arbitrary I, we've got to pick something in the short term and then give ourselves the option to reevaluate it we may be, maybe 24 months may be just fine, but let's, let's get information. Let's not, let's not be arbitrary. Anyone else wants to speak on this item? Mr. Bonin? Uh, yeah, I would uh, actually like to suggest, uh, Mr. Cedillo's suggestion is um, uh, we do 12 months then instead of 24. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a situation now, uh, colleagues, where I, I, I hate to sound like Chicken Little, but um, uh, and I hope I do sound, I hope I do turn out to be chicken little, but I, I think we're on the verge of uh, a, a global economic uh, catastrophe and that we are going to see uh, people thrown out onto the streets. And um, we, we absolutely need to find a way to help uh, mom and pop landlords, and I'm hoping the state will, will come through on us. But when we are talking in many cases here about families who are already paying 90% of their income, 90% of their income, hundreds of thousands of people in Los Angeles in that predicament, they are not going to be able to, to, to pay this back quickly. Uh, and if, if 24 months is a bridge too far uh, for, for, for all those who are sort of hanging on by, 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 by their fingernails, trying not to, to allow this to, to throw them and their families out on the street, I, I would implore us to uh, at least go for the, the 12 months instead. Mr. Cedillo? For the same reasons stated, and I would add that it, it also allows, uh, it's definite, it's certain, it allows a timetable, it's reasonable, it's responsible, it's not too far, it doesn't uh, permit that, you know, relax, I don't have to deal with it now, but it's actually something that I think is very measured and, and meets the challenges of the moment, uh, and hopefully we're overreaching, but uh, I don't think that we are, and I trust that the the renters also, no one wants to carry debt, and that uh, if we're not met with these challenges, that this provides an opportunity. Uh, there's nothing that prevents us from paying in a shorter period, so I'd ask for an I vote. All right, thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Is there a second to Mr. Bonin's amendment? Second. Okay, Mr. Cedillo, thank you. Mr. Gakorian? Uh, thank you, Madam President. So um, we are in uncharted territory for sure in a, in a major crisis situation, but um, just to think this through a little bit. This is not limited to RSO tenants. It's, it applies to all tenants of rental property, no matter their income, no matter how wealthy they are, no matter whether they're renting a single family home or a studio apartment. Uh, 24 months or even 12 months will extend their rental payment uh, obligations in most cases beyond the term of their lease and in many cases beyond the term of their tenancy uh, which means that any remaining rental payments will be essentially uncollectible um, after that period of time it'll be you know a, a debt sure 
but a debt that a landlord will never be able to collect. Um, so I think we have to be a little realistic about what it is that we, what we're doing here. And we are basically shifting loss. We're not um, doing anything other than shifting this loss. And if we don't do that in a way that, as Mr. Blumenfeld says, is not entirely arbitrary, um, you know, at, physicians say first do no harm. We have, uh, we run the risk of actually accelerating, you know, a lot of adverse economic consequences that could be much longer lasting than the coronavirus. So I, 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 I get that Chicken Little is important at this point, Mr. Bonin, but so is not messing up an already fragile housing market that we have uh, with the least affordable housing uh, anywhere in America. Um, and so I, I hope that as we do this, we do it um, carefully. We do it with some data to support our conclusions and that when this comes back for final you know, approval, that we actually have an opportunity to consider all of these options and others. For example, I would throw out another suggestion. Maybe, uh, and I don't know if we can even do this consistent with state law, uh, but maybe landlords who are in the position of, um, that, that we're talking about here should be allowed to apply the security deposit as current rent. And then the continuing obligation, the renter would, would refill the security deposit, essentially, so that at least they're not taking that sudden hit uh, and having to pay their mortgage while the sec security deposit is sitting in a bank and they can't touch it. So those might be, you know, the sorts of approaches we might want to take. Um, I would also note that in the second moving clause, uh, we impose upon the landlord's penalties if they don't inform tenants, uh, but the language also indicates the right to forgiveness of rent, and I want to make sure that we're clear that I don't think I've heard anybody around this horseshoe yet uh, recommend forgiveness of rent. We're talking about a, pro, a moratorium on evictions for the non-payment of rent and a, a repayment obligation that continues rather than forgiveness. Um, so those are my only points on, on that. But um, you know, whatever number we pick, whether it's three months or six months or 12 months or 24 months, some people are not going to be able to make that. And, and I think we know that as we're going in. We also know that some landlords will be able to absorb those, some landlords won't. And some landlords will lose their buildings, either to banks, where they'll, where they'll be probably sold off to some, one of these, um, one of these uh, consolidators or you know, uh, funds, national funds that buy up distressed properties. Um, these are actual consequences that will occur if we don't get this right. And when they do occur, housing is not going to be more affordable in this city. Housing is not going to be made more accessible to more people in this city. It's going to be less so. Thank you, Mr. Gukorian. Um, Mr. Wesson? You know, I agree uh, w with you, Paul, that these are actual uh, coinc I mean, this will actually occur just like individuals will actually lose their apartments and be, be forced to live on the streets. I think it is appropriate that we take a deep breath and, and, and a, a time out. I referenced earlier, we are all in this together, from the renter all the way up to the bank. So I could live with the 12 months. But that's why I said earlier it is so important that we engage in a conversation with all of the principals so that we can listen to tenants' rights organizations and we can listen to the mom and pops. I think that they have the opportunity to give us suggestions and recommendations how we move forward that we can't even think of. So basically what we're asking for at this point is a timeout, chat with them, and see if we can come up with something that works the best. So uh, I don't know, you know what the count is, who's going to go where, but we have to act. We have to act.
quickly because individuals will be placed on the street, which exacerbates a problem that we're already dealing with. And then another thing that concerns me too is that you have so many people that have spent their lives investing in an eight unit or a 12-unit apartment, and that is their retirement. We've, they need to sit at the table and tell us things that they're comfortable with doing and how long that uh, uh, they can do them. I think that the, the lenders and the banks can give us accounting maneuvers and other ideas that we haven't thought about yet. But we do need to act. We do need to act quickly. And I think we need to give ourselves realistically enough time to bring people in and discuss this. Because the things that we're acting on now are things that we have to act on and act on quickly. But we will be making a big mistake if we don't, do not bring everybody in. In order for us to survive as a country, we're going to have to come together. We're going to have to, in order for this country to stay afloat, we're all going to have to work together. So I think that uh, I get calls from my small businesses and landlords concerned just like everybody else, and I tell them we're in the business of trying to help everyone. But let's help the ones that are most vulnerable. Let's help the ones that we know that are weeks away from being placed on the street. Bring in our other stakeholders and try to come up with something common sense that we can form a consensus uh, uh, on. So I do support 12 months. I could support uh, less, but the key is we got to act. We got to act quickly, and we need to take advantage of their expertise. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Mr. Blumenfield? Uh, just, just adding on, because I... I go ahead. Re I'm so sorry. The reason why I wanted to speak on this for, uh, in the first place until you guys got into it, on the last moving clause, I'd like to amend it where it says rental assistant for tenants, and I'd like to add and students. Okay, is there a second on that? Second. Okay, second by who, Mr. Buscaino? Ah. Okay, so, Mr. Blumenfield? No, just, just adding on to what, what Mr. Wesson said, I, I don't think that the answer is ultimately going to be a negotiation about the number of months. It's going to be much more complicated. It's going to be a formula. It's going to involve other uh, give and takes besides just months, rent, and other things that can, that can be negotiated. So I just think we ought to, we ought to act on a, on a short period of time and give ourselves the space to bring in the folks. We all want to give as much as we can uh, to both the renters and the, um, the landlords, especially the mom and pop ones. Uh, Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Madam President. Just wanted to add one other consideration. We may want to have uh, some sort of an income cap, at least look at that, because uh, renters like myself uh, don't necessarily need to avail themselves of this, but some people may just because the opportunity is there. So. Uh, we should consider that as well. Okay, Ms. Rodriguez, follow Mr. Mr. O'Farrell, and then Mr. Cedillo. Thank you, Madam President. And I want to thank Mr. Gregorian for those very insightful and thoughtful comments. Um, having lived through the last housing bubble in the housing arena, working for the Realtors Association, I will tell you that it was only through the intervention of the federal government that we were able to actually reconstruct the lending for families to avoid foreclosure. And in the same circumstance, we're gonna need the federal government to intervene with lending the teeth of the Department of Treasury and HUD to help create an environment where many of these landlords who have these mortgages are gonna put lenders in a position to actually force them to cooperate. We saw record numbers of foreclosures that were occurring at a time when, uh, during, when folks uh, who were overextended, when uh, the housing prices were falling, uh, falling faster and faster into foreclosure. But if not for having worked with then the Obama administration to help create uh, new regulatory uh, methods to forcing the lenders to creating things like uh, the uh, like the Hoffa program so that they could actually manage or even do short sales because none of the lenders were actually cooperating in creating a standardized method of even conducting short sales so the reality is is that um, as much as I know we are eager to create an environment here that protects renters and trust me I 
you know, I remember slowing down. We were slowing down as much as we could uh, for closures because we wanted to keep families in homes. That didn't help anybody. And I think it's still true today. We need to do everything possible to stem the tide of seeing more families pushed into homelessness because they're not able to make ends meet right now given the circumstances of COVID-19. So, but I think it would be irresponsible for us to uh, create such an environment where we extend such a period that until the federal government comes in, we're gonna force these landlords into this situation. So uh, it's because of that experience and having lived through it once before on the outside uh, that I actually am comfortable with a six month because I think the reality is, is that we do need the federal government assistance to force lenders to be at this table. Because I will tell you, they will not come here willingly. They haven't before. They were forced into that situation before. And I think it's going to be required of the federal government to help assure that we are forcing them to this table again. Because I know that a lot of these property owners are, are going to also be struggling with making those payments, given that we are going to be uh, adopting these measures. And I think they're important measures. I think it's responsible to make sure that we're keeping families in homes, uh, in their uh, keeping shelter over their heads. That's why we're also providing a series of relief efforts from the state and federal government and even here locally, where many of us are trying to provide resources that will help float them during this critical time as well. So uh, I'm comfortable with six months. Um, I think these are important measures that we need to take, uh, but I also recognize that the, the truth of the matter is, and to Mr. Wesson's point, we need everybody at the table, uh, but we certainly need the federal government's teeth to help us assure that we uh, get those lenders to cooperate as well. Thank okay, you. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, whatever decisions we make today, we can always modify one week from today and the week after that, depending on this very fast moving, very quickly changing uh, pandemic. And we, we absolutely do need to build guardrails around this. Uh, you know, I always talk about the unintended consequences of something. And um, perhaps we could have Rushmore Cervantes and Dave Michelson uh, to answer a few questions about what their impressions are of the language as it is currently written and the, the types of language we're, we're, we're discussing now uh, in terms of possibly modifying this. Because what we seek to do is provide immediate relief to the thousands of renters who are going to be impacted by the coronavirus uh, you know, pandemic. And that means many, if not most, of our uh, service uh, employees, our workers in the service industry. Um, and that is not necessarily specified in terms of the moratorium on evictions either. It's, it's pretty general. I, and I think it includes all moratoriums on all evictions, even if it's a pre-existing violation of a lease agreement. So I don't want to start throwing my Hold on for just a second. I, I, Mr. O'Farrell, I haven't yeah. called either one of these gentlemen to the table, so... Can mm -hmm. you just give me just a second? Yeah. So anyone else have any questions of uh, both HCID and the city attorney's office? So we can go ahead and... Thank you. Thank you. So, so in terms of your read on this and, and what we, I think, collectively strive to accomplish with a, an eviction moratorium, what are some of your thoughts? Uh, Rushmore Cervantes with HSID. Thank you very much for the, uh, the question, Councilman. Uh, in reading the motion, uh, obviously the council, everyone is trying to respond as quickly as possible to address this crisis. The uh, first matter of I move, therefore move, is where it says draft an emergency ordinance implementing a temporary moratorium on evictions and late fees until the emergency declaration is lifted. Now, um, the, the governor's executive order is more broadly defining, or actually I should say more specifically defining as it relates to COVID-19 related non-payment. The language within this executive order by the governor is very explicit, and I've had Dave Michelson for the city attorney's office look at this as well. It appears that the way this order is written, it precludes the city from being so broad in nature relative to the blanket moratorium on evictions it, mm -hmm. because it's not tying specifically to COVID-19 related uh, deficiencies in income that and does not enable them to pay their rents. 
So in discussing this, I mean, this is really something we need to discuss relative to do we want, I understand the need that the desire of some council members to not necessarily require uh, verification. Uh, it would certainly be easier for the city and the department or to implement if it was just a broad stroke across the board. But in looking specifically at the, the, the governor's order, it appears like there are some limitations that relates to that and certainly could have further implications even if we were to proceed notwithstanding that, that uh, a deviation from the, uh, the governor's order. And Mr. Michelson, do you Thank have anything you. to add to that? Sure. Good afternoon, David Michelson, Office of City Attorney. I think Rushmore uh, summed that up uh, quite well. You know, in looking at um, you know, state law, some constitutional legal principles, and very importantly, the governor's order that came out last night, uh, local governments such as yourself clearly have uh, leeway in this incredible um, uh, difficult time with this pandemic to enact uh, laws to protect uh, tenants, both residential and commercial. Um, but the governor's order uh, zeroes in on um, the coronavirus as the justification uh, with respect to uh, renters' um, protections from eviction. And if you have had a chance to look at the governor's order that came out last night, it's really focused on where uh, tenants, residential or commercial, are unable to make rent payments um, during the emergency uh, because of things related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and therefore, as Rushmore is pointing out in this first, I therefore move paragraph at the bottom of your first page, it would appear to sweep too broadly. And we would encourage you to stay <coughs> focused on um, the concern around the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, using that as the rationale for when renters cannot make their rent payment to afford them that uh, eviction protection, whether residential or commercial. Um, and in speaking to the period of time by which renters can pay rent that is otherwise lawfully due, as you know, I'm sure that the mayor's order provided for a six-month window mm -hmm. for um, rent to uh, be paid uh, to the landlords after the um, closure of the emergency, uh, there, you know, we're in uncharted legal territories, uh, unfortunately, so I cannot point to any particular uh, case law or statutory law um, that speaks directly to what specific period of time will be lawful. But the longer the period of time, the, the, more, the greater the likelihood that um, uh, a, a law would be viewed as unconstitutional as to impairments of contracts. So, I appreciate what Councilmember Blumenfeld said and others in terms of maybe incrementally having the opportunity to roll this out based on additional information that comes forward. I appreciate that. I, I think you made an argument for a consistent approach or, or something that is informed by what the state is doing, et cetera. Just the other, Madam President, just the other points I want to make in terms of um, uh, is, there, is there a contingency on this, or might there be, this is just rhetorical, might there be a contingency in terms of the uh, landlords that would be at risk with their mortgage payments, uh, a contingency based on state and or federal action in that regard, and that's rhetoric because we don't have the answer yet. Right. Um, but that's something to consider. And is there a tie to the AMI in terms of um, the uh, those who might face evictions um, that can easily afford relocating somewhere else. That question would be more pertinent if it were broadly way beyond the coronavirus um, reason for, for the moratorium. Um, and then um, could there be in this, and this is something to think about too, maybe for next week, um, a utility uh, a utility sort of um, delay uh, in uh, sort of in invoking some sort of utility delay for property owners where uh, a moratorium on eviction has been um, invoked. Uh, that's something uh, I, I heard from one um, property owner today on my way out uh, that said, look, I'm, I'm already on the ropes and something like that could really help us because we certainly don't want to lose our tenants, and we certainly support the moratorium eviction, uh, eviction on moratorium, but something as, as basic as delaying payment on our own utility bills, which most property owners are, are liable for, 
is, is certainly an important factor. So um, I, I would argue that, that it absolutely should be tied to the coronavirus, and we should stick with exactly whom we're trying to assist right now and have a real balanced uh, approach in this. Okay. Uh, one thing I, I would like to add to that, Councilman, just for a point of reference, uh, uh, when uh, Council uh, President Martinez introduced and championed the emergency rental relief uh, fund uh, when we were getting ready for the implementation of uh, AB 1482, mm -hmm. we did design that program around uh, constituents that were 80 percent area median income and below, for just a point of reference. So mm -hmm. uh, the way it's currently worded, it would be uh, with no income restrictions. I, I, and lastly, thank you. Uh, lastly, I think that we don't know yet. I know that, that uh, Trump just uh, proposed a $1 trillion bailout essentially today. We don't know what that is going to look like. But something that everything we do at the local level should be tied in some way, should have a reference to state and federal action in terms of relief for all parties that are affected by the coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Kikorian. Council for your sage uh, perspective on this. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Um, I've been persuaded. Uh, very compelling. Uh, six months gives us uh, enough to look forward. It helps us address concerns, uh, legal questions in terms of length of contracts and impairment of contracts. Makes us coherent as a city uh, with the mayor's uh, perspective on this. And so, uh, speaking to Mr. Bonin, I'm prepared to withdraw my second. Uh, he's satisfied with that and suggests that we move forward with the proposal for Thank six Thank you, months. Mr. Cedillo. Mr. Bonin, did you have, want to find another second, or are you withdrawing your motion? Uh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll withdraw it um, uh, withdraw with the it? proviso that I'll be trying to extend it later. Okay. Um, uh, I will be as determined as Mr. Koretz and keep on going. Um, uh, did, did want to note on this issue, colleagues, that um, if for any reason somebody is evicted in the next couple months, they will be on the streets. Even if they have enough money to find another place, they ain't finding another place because nobody's having an open house. Nobody's bringing people into their homes for a while now. Uh, so an eviction notice is move into an encampment, an encampment unless you have a, a, a relative who's going to let you come on the couch. That's the reality we're in now. So as to the, the, the scope of it and the, the, the questions that were raised, um, uh, I think it's probably at this point and it certainly will be by the time the ordinance comes back to us, uh, it is going to be the effect that the economic circumstances of anybody facing eviction is going to have been touched in some way by the coronavirus. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I would ask that we, we move forward with this language and the city attorney come back with the responsible way of, of implementing that, uh, uh, understanding that everybody qualifies Everybody qualifies at this point. There is not a person in Los Angeles whose, whose life and whose income is not going to be impacted by the, the coronavirus. What I want to avoid at all costs is having some administrative process by which uh, a, 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 an, an immigrant housekeeper who is at home right now with three kids who are out of LAUSD has to navigate some bureaucratic maze in order to get the relief that we are trying to, 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 to uh, impart. If, if, if we have a, a burden of proof on a tenant, if we have an administrative process that we are going to enforce, and let's be honest, we kind of suck at enforcing stuff, um, uh, then this rule uh, is going to be more gums than teeth. And so that is the objective, is to avoid uh, a, a hurdle or an administrative process for people. Thank you, Mr. Bonner, Mr. Gregorian, and Mr. Blumenfield. Well, I think after um, hearing Mr. Michelson, I hadn't even thought of the fact that our legal ability to do this is in some ways constrained by existing state law on evictions as modified by the governor's emergency order, right? Is that, is that correct? So, um, so I would follow the city attorney's advice on, on how we limit the moratorium. Um, but I was going to suggest that the, the, the existence of the moratorium and 
how rapidly the back rent gets paid are really two distinct issues. And the moratorium is the emergency. I think we all would probably, uh, to a person, would agree that we need to enact the moratorium to the greatest extent we legally can to protect people who are being economically impacted by this right now. And the, we can take the time to work out how are we going to handle lenders, how are we going to handle uh, repayment obligations. So that, that's not as urgent as protecting people from being evicted tomorrow. Um, so I, I was going to suggest that maybe we can separate those two issues and uh, perhaps when it comes back, since we're going to have to vote on all of this separately, maybe those can be presented separately. We can even have an ICO if, if it's within our ability to do that on the moratorium. Um, and then the, the other part, we can debate and discuss whether six months makes sense or 12 months makes sense or you know how we involve the lenders in this or not i i just think that those are two separate issues so so that that was my first point um and then uh oh gosh i'm sorry i forgot my other point uh, sorry I'll come back to it, I guess, if I remember. Uh, okay, Mr. Blumenfield, so, did you want to add anything to this? Yeah, just in, it's building on what Mr. Bonin said about the connection. I understand legally it needs to be connected to COVID-19. We all know that everything economically is connected to that, and so just in the drafting of it, creating sort of the affirmative defense uh, or the affirmative argument that unless proven otherwise, you know, economic hardship during this time, you know, during this time is related to COVID-19. And if we can make that finding yep. or create that affirmative um, defense, so to speak, we could stay legal with our, our COVID-19 requirement and be as broad as we all want to be. Now, did you think about it, Mr. Corian? I did. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that accommodation, Madam President. And I think uh, it's somewhat related to Mr. Blumenfield's point just now. Um, the language as it is now is a moratorium on all evictions for any circumstances whatsoever, including Mr. Rue's party houses in his district and, you know, any number of other reasons that somebody might be evicted. I, I think what we're getting at is people who are being evicted for non-payment of rent. And um, so I, I think it should be so limited. Otherwise, um, we really are well beyond the, the, the range of issues that are related to, to, the, to the virus. So that I I would propose that what I think should be proposed as an amendment that this that the um, first moving clause uh, should be limited to uh, implementing a temporary moratorium on evictions and late fees uh, relating to non-payment of rent until the emergency declaration. Okay. Is, is there a second, Mr. O'Farro, Mr. Bonin? I I, I want to be cautious about that. That 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 makes sense on first blush. But uh, there are, are, are going to be landlords who are going to try to use this as an opportunity to force people out uh, who may have made the, the last rent thing, but they're going to uh, uh, come up with, with, with some other excuse. And I think we want to be mindful of the fact that ev evicting somebody now means they're going to be homeless. Uh, and and while, while that, that, that seems like it, the... the, the the non-payment of rent seems like it passes the, the, the reasonable virtue test of who we're trying to protect. The, I think the secondary goal of, of this body has got to be to prevent more people living on tents in our streets. Uh, and if we craft too narrowly, we're going to wind up uh, with more people uh, on, on the streets uh, within a couple of weeks. All right. Mr. Gakorian, did you want to speak on this again? You're back on the queue. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead. We're going to be, there's three motions on the floor. So let's prepare to vote on the motion introduced by Mr. Wesson and seconded by Mr. Buscaino. Sorry. We're going to go back to Mr. Gregorian's um, motion seconded by Mr. O'Farrell. 
Did you want to go ahead and So on the repeat? first moving clause, to limit the moratorium to and waiver late fees, uh, moratorium on evictions and late fees to uh, non-payment of rent. All right. Moved by Mr. Kokorian and second by Mr. O'Farrell. Let's, let's go ahead and prepare to vote on this motion. Let's open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Fourteen eyes, one no. Okay, let's go ahead and prepare to vote on Mr. Wesson's motion to include students. Mr. Wesson, would you like to clarify your motion? It was seconded by Mr. Buscaino. Oh, it's just, it's no clear it's no clarification. If you look at the last moving clause, it talks about providing rental assistance for tenants, and I am just adding and students, in particular college students that uh, uh, are, are now losing their dorm rooms or, or apartment and what have you. So that's, that's all. And this deals uh, specifically with the Well, I think, I, I think you can keep it simple and broad by just saying and students. All right, let's prepare to vote on that amendment. Let's open the roll. Close the row and tabulate the vote. Fifteen okay, the, nice. Okay, the last um, motion on this item, amending motion, I should say, was introduced by Mr. Lee. Did you want to speak on, do you want to reiterate your um, amending motion on this item? Yeah, just that we move the second. I further move to a more manageable six months instead of the 24 months to fill the payment obligations. Okay, very well. And that was um, seconded by Mr. Kokorian. Let's go ahead and vote on that. Let's open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes, 2 noes. Okay, now we're gonna, vote the, we're gonna vote on the item as amended. Let's open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. Uh, for clarification, Madam President, that would be now 72N as amended by the three motions that passed, which were Krikorian O'Farrell, Wesson Buscaino, and Lee Krikorian. Correct. Let's go ahead and open the row. Close the row and tabulate the vote. 15 eyes. Okay, let's move on.